Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'll wait just a moment uh, as everyone uh, filters in here and then we'll get started. I'm so glad you could all make it today for our spotlight talk on preserving Eshrick's windows. Um, my name is Katie Wynn. I'm the Communications and Public Programs Director, and I'm here with the museum's Building Preservation Director, Andy Gustine, who will be leading the talk today. Um, if this is your first spotlight, uh, essentially these are our little 20 minute programs where we dive into a particular object or a particular aspect of the museum, followed by some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, we do ask that you keep yourself on mute during the program. If you would like to ask questions, and which we would love uh, to hear from you, um, we just ask that you save that for the end of the program. So you can unmute yourself when we get to that portion and just ask your question right there. Or if you prefer, you are very welcome to kind of put things in the chat as the program goes on and we'll, we'll get to them at the end as well. And um, with that, I th I'll turn it over to Andy and uh, we'll get started. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everybody. Um, so I uh, have been, you know, I've had the honor and pleasure to be uh, entrusted with the care of Wharton's architectural creations for several years. I started first in 2017 with a little bit of repair work on some windows on the workshop. Um, and then in, in 2020, uh, we did quite a bit of work on the uh, windows on the studio, uh, mostly repainting and reglazing, sort of regular preservation maintenance, uh, a little bit of wood repair. Um, but that was the point where uh, I began to be curious about uh, the Wharton's choice of uh, manufactured component in this otherwise exquisitely handcrafted studio. Um, two questions kept bubbling up in my head. Why casement windows? They're, they're pretty uncommon, uh, especially before the 1970s, 80s. And, um, you know, in, in so much of his buildings are so traditional in form, why did he kind of choose a different look? Um, the other question is why would you, why would he choose a manufactured window when he had all these craftspeople uh, with him, working with him? He could have, um, you know, gotten some shop made windows, custom to whatever detail he wanted, invented all kinds of little features like he did with so many other things, his doors, uh, making his own sinks and uh, you know, every other component of this building. So why, why would he choose a manufactured window? Um, I want to step back and look at the history of windows very briefly, just to kind of put in perspective this moment in 1940, um, which is when he bought all these windows and installed them on the studio. So. I'm gonna share my screen real quick here. I can find it. And hopefully everyone will see an image pop up. Did it work? Looks good. good. All right. So, uh, you know, these, this is a, an image, first image here is just a, a shot, uh, kind of an odd uh, angle of the studio. We had some scaffolding up when we did these windows. So we had interesting perspectives. Um, and then the, in the sort of mid ground there, you see some of the, the uh, casement windows that were installed on that wood addition in 1940. Um, another shot of the studio. So, uh, window history. Before 1700, there was very little clear glass in any windows. Um, and that was because glass was all handmade. It was very difficult to make. 
very expensive. It wasn't very clear, even if you could buy a piece of glass for a window. Um, and so very few windows had glass. Uh, windows were made uh, in buildings, but were basically just uh, bare openings and would have been closed up for weather or security by means of a wooden shutter, or maybe some sort of a panel with uh, a, a, an animal skin stretched across uh, to get some light in the building. Um, the image on the left is a 15th century building um, with the, the, the glass uh, windows you see in it there are 19th century alterations. But when that building was built uh, and those windows were constructed, they were just naked openings. The image on the left from the 17th century, um, where we begin to see some actual clear glass uh, glazed windows, um, but very few of them were, would have been operable and only you would only have seen them in, um, in the buildings uh, of the wealthy. So if we move on into the late 17th, early 18th century, um, the first operable windows that became fairly common were casement windows. And uh, initially they would have been uh, similar to the, the diagram on the left, um, made uh, out of a, an iron sash, uh, fitted with a leaded glass, a uh, unit that was uh, riveted into that sash. And then that whole uh, contraption hung on hinges that were mounted into the structural wooden frame of the window opening. And so these casement windows would, would open and close uh, like a door, uh, swing out. Um, some were made to swing in, um, but they were uh, not, they didn't have all the sort of, uh, modern features that made them easy to keep open or, or uh, hold, hold them closed. Um, and again, they were still, glass was still very expensive and uh, these windows would have only been really uh, on uh, buildings, on houses of the wealthy. Um, the image on the right, is uh, something everyone's familiar with, of course. Um, and by the 18th, uh, during the 18th and 19th century, this became the window, particularly uh, in the United States, the most common window. Um, and it was developed uh, in colonial America. Um, and it was a, it's called a hung window, and it was uh, designed with a wooden sash that would slide up and down vertically. Again, everybody's familiar with this style of window, but interestingly, um, it really didn't exist uh, before 1800. And it was largely um, you know, popularized in the American colonies, uh, partly because uh, of developments in glass making technology, making it now a little more affordable to buy glass. Um, and the industrial revolution making that even more affordable and probably most importantly, the abundance of timber in the new world. Um, in Europe, there was a, a shortage of timber. Um, and so that's why things were made, uh, windows, early windows were made out of iron. Um, so then around 1900, um, Getting closer to the turn of the century, we see the development of steel uh, windows, initially for large scale industrial buildings, but, but this was also applied to residential use as well, particularly uh, during the Tudor revival period where it mimicked those iron uh, casement windows we saw earlier. Eschrick actually used very similar uh, windows in the studio uh, the first uh, phase of the studio, 1926, uh, for the north window. Um, and uh, they were actually, I guess, his first use of manufactured uh, components. 
though we think uh, that these were probably salvaged from uh, an earlier building. In 1926, he also installed uh, some other windows and he chose at that time to use uh, shop made casement windows. You can see one here in this east gable. And there is actually one that still uh, exists in the west gable. Um, the, uh, the last, uh, the only original wooden window from that 1926 um, phase. Um, so let's see, where am I here? In 1940, when he builds the, the two-story addition, uh, the wood addition here, uh, that's when he uh, does choose these manufactured Pella windows. Uh, this actually, this image was taken in 1947, a little bit later, uh, while, under, while the uh, bathroom and kitchen are already under construction. Um, I just, I like this image. I'm gonna show another image, a couple, uh, in just a moment from the other, uh, a, a different perspective, kind of the other side of the building. Uh, I just love this image because it's so primitive looking. Um, and, and in contrast to the next image that I'll show you or uh, I'll show you in a minute here. Um, so back to history. Um, in, in the early thirties, um, there is a major shift in window design and manufacturing and a couple of small, uh, pretty small regional window shops decide to try an idea of pre-assembling all the window components together in one unit um, and shipping them, you know, uh, marketing them uh, nationally. This, the window you see in this image is uh, a historic uh, Anderson window unit. And Anderson was the first company to do this uh, in the early thirties. And soon after them, uh, Pella followed suit. This is a, uh, a patent application um, design drawing for, uh, by, submitted by this fella who uh, was the owner of the Pella window company. And it's for the, the whole unit, the window structure. And you can see the patent was uh, filed in 1936 and uh, it was granted in 1940, right about the same time that Wharton builds his two-story addition. And this is the other angle of that uh, addition that I was talking about. Very different, looks, looks very different visually, um, much more, you know, Kind of modern and uh, sophisticated looking. Um, and uh, yeah, it's I just think it's remarkable um, that that he puts puts these this combination of uh, you know sort of primitive uh, materials and uh, forms together in in such a sophisticated way. So uh, there is, uh, here's some, some of the uh, literature Wharton was probably taking a look at as he was uh, choosing windows. Um, and again, kind of as part of the, the marketing campaign for these windows, Pella and Anderson uh, put out all kinds of great little packets of information. And, and uh, I think some of the reasons that uh, Wharton chose this, uh, these units uh, are kind of outlined in this literature. They uh, had uh, roll screens, so screens that pulled down uh, from above were, were kind of um, hidden inside a little component, a little uh, frame, part of the frame on the, on the top of the window. Um, they had really nicely designed and made hardware. They had uh, insulated glass. They had uh, a double acting hinge that allowed you to uh, reach out and clean the outside of the window. Uh, weather stripping, um, all these features that we recognize today in windows um, were 
available back then. And you know, here's so here's a shot of the uh, the window in the studio, um, the nineteen circa nineteen forty Pella window. Uh, I before uh, learning all this and and working on these windows, I really uh, have always been a manufactured window skeptic. Um, in fact. Pretty much any time I've encountered a window uh, that I've had to work on or repair, um, you know, made in the last forty or fifty years, it's been uh, terrible. Really, they're um, they seem to be designed to uh, you know to fall apart after about twenty years. Um, hardware is flimsy, kind of cheap looking. The screens are uh, obtrusive, etc. So. Imagine my surprise when I started uh, opening and closing these windows, looking at some of these components that I didn't even know what they were, the roll screen, um, some of the clips and hardware. Uh, there really are uh, beautifully made. Um, here's a, one of the cast brass uh, crank handles, great patina on it. The roll screen. Um, this is on that same window. You can see it. I, I pulled it a few down a few inches. This whole thing uh, disappears up into the the head jam, and but when you want it, you pull it all the way down. It clips at the bottom, stays in place. When you don't want it, it, it slides up out of the way. Um, the the windows, the sash have uh, have are fitted with uh, interior storm panels. And those storm panels are, are held in place by these cute little machined aluminum sort of cam action clips. Um, you know, teeny weeny little things. They're like a thumbnail size and they're, I just think they're so cute. Um, here's a shot of the, the windows uh, from inside during the you know, shot taken in the 40s when Wharton was there. And looking out to the uh, unobstructed view of the valley below. I, um, I really just think these, these windows are, are a great example of the golden age of industrial design. They have all the conveniences of windows that we, you know, that we know today, but every element uh, is thoughtfully designed uh, to not just work well, but also look good, feel good uh, when you're operating it, and also to last. Um, these windows have been in place for uh, 80 some years, and uh, I, I, that's pretty impressive. Um, and, and these are all the key elements of Eshrix furniture and buildings. Uh, this was a manufactured product that I think Wharton felt was worthy of incorporating into his masterpiece. So even in uh, when he builds the silo in 1966, and this is um, you know 26 years later, he again uses Pella windows, uh, pretty much the same window, although they have. Uh, you know, they've changed a little bit and he opts for just a single pane glass rather than divided light. Same kinds of features, same double acting hinge, uh, same uh, interior storm panel. Things are a little, you know, have been whittled away a little bit. They aren't quite as uh, solid and attractive as the 40s version. But, uh, but still a solid window and have held up really well. Uh, here's a shot from the outside. Again, you can see this double acting hinge. Another image uh, during, during the work we did in 2020. And there's a shot of the two together, 1940, 1966. So, you know, again, why? Why did Wharton choose these windows? Um, 
I don't know for sure. I haven't found, you know, the, the letter to a friend that described his, his uh, process. But uh, my hunch, my uh, theory is that it's probably for the same reasons that I'm so impressed by them. They were this, they were sort of an exciting new innovation um, with all these clever uh, elements and conveniences that I would imagine him designing into a window himself if he had to make it himself, but, um, but he didn't have to. These fit his vision and, uh, and so that's what he chose. I think that's it. So uh, if anyone has questions, fire away. I guess Andy, they're- Nancy, the, that's a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for kind of diving into the details there. You're welcome. Um, it's really interesting. And I, I was thinking also, um, I don't know if you'd like to share, um, you had told me some, some stories about how the sort of lengths that you've gone to or the people you've connected with just to maintain, you know, something that's a manufactured product that's not, you know, exactly manufactured in this style anymore. So yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you could share a little bit about how you, how you do that. Sure. Yeah, actually, um, I mean, the interesting piece dur during the, the work we did on the windows in 2020, one thing that uh, we discovered um, that is going to be a problem in the future is the, those double acting hinges. Uh, some of them, they're a, they were a, a galvanized steel hinge um, that was then painted by Wharton. And, and we, you know, Bob uh, et al. have uh, all maintained the paint pretty well, but they are beginning to deteriorate. There's some corrosion that's uh, caused a couple of them to really freeze up and we weren't able to open them very easily. So I started kind of off in search of how can I find, if, if we need to replace these hinges, where can I find them? Uh, I thought perhaps I would call Pella Corporation and somebody would say, oh my gosh, this is a, a National Historic Landmark. Of course, we'll dig out the uh, design drawings and make some for you. But no, uh, I hit a dead end there. Um, got no interest from anyone at Pella. Um, I posted on a couple of sort of message boards, window geek kind of forums. Um, and then I got a response from a guy in Virginia who uh, had a ha has a house that he was renovating. And he was really sad to have to take out a few Pella windows uh, that are of the same era. And, um, you know, suggested that if we wanted to salvage any of the hardware, he would be open to that. So anyway, one thing led to another and uh, eventually he, he had his builders strip some of the hardware and sent us a little care package. And I now have uh, three or four pair of these hinges all in really excellent condition as well as some other bits of hardware stored away for when we need them. So that was a, a needle in a haystack that was fun to find. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for, for sure. sharing that story. You never know when, you know, something is something's going to be useful to someone else, right? You got to get on those message boards. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, the first one's from Sandy Hughes, who's wondering um, if you have a sense of how expensive these were, which I think is a great question because we often think of Eshrick as being so thrifty and. Yeah. Um, exactly. I don't know. Um, I, I actually have no idea. Uh, I was hoping, um, I mean, I did some, uh, I, I, I searched through all of our, our archives, all of our records, hoping that I might stumble upon an invoice or a receipt or some kind of correspondence, um, but I, I didn't. I haven't found anything and, uh, and I didn't turn up anything uh, in searching sort of for that information in general. So I don't know, uh, I'm guessing um, they weren't cheap, but at the same time, I would imagine, uh, again, with all the features that were built into them, um, I can see Eshrick possibly making the calculation that they were a better deal than him 
trying to figure it all out himself. So um, not really an answer to your question, but I, I guess, yeah, the answer is I don't know. And uh, I see the second question, uh, did he buy directly from the manufacturer? Uh, again, we don't know. Uh, I'm guessing, uh, I, I believe when these windows were marketed originally, they were set up uh, in, a sim in a way similar to today where they were sold through distributors, you know, local lumber yards, building materials, suppliers. So um, that would be my hunch. Uh, but again, I don't know for certain. Um, Sandy asks also, is Pella still in existence? And yes, they absolutely are. Um, I thought perhaps that everyone would have heard of Pella windows, but apparently not. That was my mistake for not, not mentioning that. Um, how are we preserving the windows? Uh, the best uh, preservation is just to maintain the paint. Um, and that's, uh, that's what we, we do in general. Uh, in 2020, in, in, in the, during the repainting process, um, we did reveal some uh, fairly small isolated areas of wood rot. Uh, and in that case, uh, these were small enough areas that what we did was simply excavate the decayed uh, area and then fill that with an epoxy. Um, if there were larger, uh, problems, uh, we would fabricate uh, wood patches and glue them in. But, uh, but the nice thing about these windows is that they are wood and wood is uh, pretty much, you know, endlessly repairable um, as long as you don't let it get too far. Uh, Sam Olshin asks, 1920s Pella, is it old growth timber? Uh, versus the 1960s Pella windows. It doesn't last as long, are you finding that? And the answer is, uh, I don't know about the old growth timber, but I, my, uh, my general experience uh, and all the windows I've ever worked with, all the buildings I've worked with, is that, uh, yeah, lumber quality uh, tends to decline uh, over time. And, um, we, you know, in the very limited ex uh, experience we had with these windows, we did have bigger problems with the, uh, the windows on the silo on, in the 1960s uh, uh, version of the windows versus the older windows. Um, you know, that, I think there are different reasons for th that that might be the case. Uh, it could be a wood quality issue. Um, both uh, the, the marketing literature for both of those uh, eras, the 1940s and the 60s, uh, mentions uh, using a wood preservative on the, the wood elements. Um, I also would guess that the paints Wharton used, uh, especially early on, um, were hand mixed and probably lead based paints. Um, and the lead, you know, my experience with older windows. Um, is often I think the the lead paint uh, the lead paint history on windows tends to act as a preservative as well. So you know hard to say uh, for sure, but yes, uh, in general, the wood quality tends to be uh, lesser and lesser over time. Marianne asks uh, if I'm aware of the Association for Pre uh, Preservation Technology. Uh, yes, I am. And uh, yes, they're a great uh, resource. And um, I, I am in touch with some, some other members there as well. Uh, and LN asks, uh, assume this glass is modern enough that to, to not, uh, not be sagging so that it looks distorted when you look through it. Um, yes. It is pretty modern glass. There's probably, uh, you know, I hadn't really thought to look closely. I'm guessing you could find some distortion in the glass. Um, you know, even, uh, even perfectly clear glass over time uh, does, can, uh, can distort a little bit. Um, it's sort of like 
really, really slow moving still liquid <laughs> is my uh, version of it. But, um, but yes, this was, this was pretty modern uh, glass technology that made both, um, both the 40s version and the 60s version. And I haven't seen any, you know, any uh, obvious bubbles or, or uh, waviness in the glass. Anybody else? I have a question for, uh, for Mr. Rob Leonard, since I see him here. Rob, do you, uh, do you have any, any thoughts? Any, anything that I got wrong or, or that you know that I didn't know? Well, you certainly know more about this than I do, but uh, I would say my thought throughout this whole thing is thank you for your tender, loving care of the studio. It's good to know that it's in good hands. Bravo. Oh, my pleasure. I see uh, one other question from Helen Gore, the purpose of the silo. Um, the silo was, uh, is, is, what, is our sort of affectionate term, I guess maybe it was uh, Wharton's term originally for the addition, uh, that, that uh, multicolored stuccoed addition that you see in that on the left in the image there, um, where he incorporated a bathroom on the ground floor, his kitchen on the, the main uh, floor, and then a uh, bathroom and, and uh, small, uh, I guess, bedroom or, or uh, dressing room above. So it's not actually a silo, it's, just what we call the silo. Wonderful. Uh, do we have any last questions that anyone's hoping to, to ask Andy while we have them? Thank you so much, Andy, for, for diving into this stuff. I'll just echo uh, what Rob Leonard said that, you know, we could all sit around and talk about how much we love the studio and you can actually help <laughs> preserve it and keep it, <laughs> keep it around for more years. So um, that's an honor. It's a pleasure. So grateful. So grateful that you're part of our team. Me too. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we do have some more programs coming up next month. Um, for those of you that don't know, it's actually our 50th anniversary as a museum this year. So we are very excited to be launching into this next uh, season of tours. And um, in March, we'll be having two, uh, well, our installation, our sort of mini exhibition in our visitor center is going to kick off the year focusing on home as site, where we're really looking at the architecture of uh, the campus. And so this is kind of a wonderful lead into that. And on the 15th of March, we'll be hearing from Sam Olshin and Lisa Justin of AOS Architects, who worked on a master campus plan with us to start envisioning what, you know, our next 50 years might look like. Um, and also in March, we'll be learning a little bit more about Ann Ting in our next Spotlight Talk. And she was um, an architect who worked with Yukon and Eshrick. Um, so we will, we will be sending yes, out a follow-up email and we will put links to that, um, links to those programs in the chat, uh, excuse me, in the email, um, as well as a recording of this event. And, um, and other than that, just thank you all again so much for, for joining us today. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you.